there. Hi everyone. Uh, can you guys hear me at the back? All right. So, um, yes. Uh, thanks for having me. My talk today is about uh, achieving better monitoring using Riemann enclosure. So, just a bit of info about myself. Uh, I've my name is Eugene, and I've been working as a software developer for about eight years now, and I'm really interested in all kinds of programming languages, especially uh, functional languages. And my, the first book that uh, brought me into the world of Lisp was uh, the, this great book by Conrad Basky called The Land of Lisp. It's about learning Lisp while programming games, and there's lots of comics in it. So uh, yes, I work at a company called uh, Radioactive. And what we do is that we work with radio broadcasters to bring their FM streams onto the internet. And we also offer uh, um, additional services like listener analytics, uh, in-stream advertising, and we also manage the mobile apps and web players for them. So what is Riemann exactly? It's an event stream processor, and it's written by Kyle Kingsbury. And in my opinion, Riemann is a very interesting and unique piece of software. And since adopting it, it's become the, uh, a key component in the mon monitoring stack that we use at Radioactive. So why would you want to choose uh, Riemann? Well, firstly, it fully embraces closure. Riemann itself is written in closure. And to configure Riemann, you would write real closure programs. So in case, you know, you're looking for a way to work closure into your existing stack at um, your workplace, this would be one way to do it. And Riemann comes with a fantastic uh, API for making your stream processing code really concise yet readable. And it's fast. It uh, makes full use of the concurrency primitives in closure uh, to process up to millions of events per second on a single hardware instance. It's also uh, efficient, so it uses protocol buffers, and that's a binary protocol. And you can also batch events up uh, when sending to Riemann. Uh, finally, it's uh, extremely versatile. Because you have the full power of closure at your disposal, you can adapt Riemann to um, whatever the needs of your organization are. And Riemann also ships with um, lots of outputs. So Riemann can output events to Elasticsearch, to InfluxDB, Graphite, and so on. Uh, right. So just to give you some background on what um, the monitoring requirements we had at Radioactive and what led us to Riemann, uh, I'd like to just um, share a bit about uh, what we run. So at Radioactive, we run a mix of uh, bare metal and cloud servers. And in the past, we had single-purpose hosts running monolithic uh, applications. And uh, over time, we broke these down into microservices running in multiple containers on the same host. And eventually, we adopted Kubernetes. So now, we no longer know where our applications are running. It could be anywhere in the cluster. Uh, just a quick show of hands, uh, how many of you here know uh, what Docker is? All right, and Kubernetes. That's pretty much the same people. Okay. Uh, yes. And in the past, our monitoring setup mainly relied on two different tools, which are namely Nagios and Ganglia. So, uh, so for those of you who have never heard of Nagios, it's pretty much the great grandfather, primarily a uh, a centralized polling system. It executes service checks either on the Nudge server itself or on your monitored host by way of a, a NRP agent. And uh, depending on the result of your service checks, it may send an alert to your notification system. So Ganglia, unlike Nudge, is uh, less concerned with running service checks and more concerned with measuring the performance of your systems over time. So uh, Ganglia agents on each host are continuously uh, gathering performance data and reporting to the designated uh, leader within that cluster. Then 
you have a central server that is continuously polling for the state of the whole cluster. And finally, uh, there's a web app to render the graphs from all your time series. And you, you would use these graphs to uh, spot problem trends, uh, do capacity planning, or you know, just to feel good about how many uh, requests your system is handling. So what kind of limitations have we found with uh, nudges and ganglia? Uh, mainly our problems with nudges. So writing alerts in nudges is uh, pretty limited. You are only able to um, operate on a single uh, value in time. So nudges only cares about the state of your system at a specific point in time. And if you want to write your alert to take into account like the previous uh, historical performance data, uh, that's not possible. Um, uh, on the other hand, Ganglia is able to uh, store and process all this data, but you know, accessing uh, Ganglia performance data from within nudges is a pretty clunky uh, process. And uh, each service check in nudges is like pretty much independent. You can't like um, from a single service check, you can't access the state of a different service check. So uh, you know this need for more flexibility in our monitoring system led us to our new uh, our newer uh, model, which uh, we call a push-based monitoring. And in this model, uh, we have collection agents running on each host. Um, gathering metrics and pushing them events to Riemann. So Riemann processes these events and decides uh, where they should go. In our case, we have set it up so that it sends uh, exceptional events to our alerting system. And uh, also, uh, we send uh, performance events to Graphite for long-term persistent storage. So one nice benefit of um, having this push-based monitoring style is that uh, there's no need to open a network port on your host. So uh, you know, in the case of nudges, you need to open the port in order for it to call your host. And there's also less configuration. So you just create new hosts or remove hosts, and there's no need to update Riemann on the state of your uh, cluster. So I'd like to talk a bit about Riemann's uh, data model. So uh, in Riemann, uh, Riemann uh, events are as simple as it gets. They are simply uh, closure maps. You can use um, all your regular closure functions to slice and dice uh, events in Riemann. And in Riemann, you have a, a standard set of fields, but um, such as the host, the service, and um, there's also a state. But you're not limited to them. You can add as many uh, arbitrary fields as you want and to make your events as rich as possible. Uh, so here's a, what um, writing stream processing code in Riemann looks like. So uh, I have like a visual representation of this code. So basically, you have like uh, a predicate function that um, filters any events that are tagged with production. And firstly, uh, you, and then you split them into two different child streams. So in the first stream, you automatically send all events to Graphite for uh, long-term storage, uh, but in the second stream, and notice that um, these are actually the same event. So with uh, immutable uh, data, you don't have to worry about the state of events changing under your feet. So anyway, uh, in the second stream, uh, you know, if the events are uh, greater than a certain threshold, then we send an email to your contact list. <coughs> so uh, getting to um, even more interesting uh, use cases are Riemann. With Riemann, you can uh, generate, uh, sorry, yeah. So uh, I, I wanted to explain here that uh, uh, Riemann streams are actually just closure functions that um, take in a single parameter, which is just the Riemann event. And you can pretty much do what you want within these functions. You can um, store it in the database, for example. Um, so uh, some more interesting use cases are Riemann you can uh, generate new types of metrics. So rather than just a simple uh, threshold um, of the CPU, you can instead uh, gather up like the last 10 seconds of events for this service and uh, extract the median value and uh, do your alert based on that median value. So this allows you to 
remove outliers in case you have like a CPU graph that's really spiky. You don't necessarily want to send an alert when that happens. Uh, so in addition to extracting the median, uh, you can also gen uh, extract um, additional percentiles. So in this case, we have the median and we have the upper percentiles and we uh, send them to graphite and uh, produce new types of graph that were not previously possible. So uh, uh, one more use case. Um, so just to give a <coughs> motivating example of what we're trying to do, uh, we want to detect anomalies in our system. So um, you know, at Radioactive, we have uh, these uh, various hosts. We have a load balancer and we have various hosts that are serving a given number of listeners at a, at a time. So um, you know, at this point in time, we have um, four hosts that have you know, 200 or so listeners, and then we have a fifth host that has no listeners. So this is an obvious problem, but it's difficult to write a check because um, you know, the number of listeners over the course of a day can um, drop to zero as well. So you wouldn't want to be alerted based on that. Now, um, to, uh, in order to deal with this in Riemann, uh, you first have to know that uh, Riemann also has this thing called the index, which is an uh, in-memory uh, data store of all the events uh, that Riemann is receiving. So we can actually... Uh, what we are doing here is that we are doing a lookup on the Riemann index to pull the data for um, all the hosts and the latest state of all the hosts that Riemann knows about. And we can then do some kind of, um, you know, like statistical uh, analysis on whether the value that we're seeing here is an anomaly or not. So uh, this code isn't complete, but what we could do is that uh, we can take the current value and we can take the values of all the different holes, then we can just do like a standard deviation. And if this one is outside of that, you know, two or three standard deviations, then hey, you've got an outlier. Uh, yeah, so that, uh, so uh, this is my last slide. So, you know, just to wrap up this talk, I just want to share some other cool things that you can do with Riemann. So you can, uh, you know, track the state of your service over time. Uh, you can change your sh uh, stream to only show the differences between each data point. So, uh, you can also forward events to other Riemann instances. And you can use, um, so in Riemann, each event comes with a TTL value. And if a host stops sending events to Riemann, then you know, Riemann will uh, detect that and it will generate an expiry event. And you can use that to alert that the host is down or something. Uh, you can also send uh, events to Riemann to indicate that you are doing some maintenance on the host. Um, you can query the index to gather additional context. So for example, if you've got a CPU alert on a host, uh, you could query the Riemann's index to gather uh, not just the CPU uh, usage, but also the memory usage, the number of connections, and uh, you know amount of this space left, and um, pack that all into your alert message. Because you know when you're getting woken up at 3 a.m., you just want to have as much information as possible. You don't want to go digging around for that info. So uh, yes, and uh, Riemann supports uh, full repo development and it has a great support for writing unit tests as well. So that's the end of my talk. And if you're interested in um, the kind of monitoring infrastructure uh, model that we use, and also how to use Rima in general, I uh, strongly recommend this book by James Turnbull called The Art of Monitoring. Uh, thanks. Is there any questions? Mostly use it to monitor the infrastructure. Right, it's uh, a monitoring tool. I'm not sure whether Riemann can do, for example, uh, uh, your application status. For example... APM? Mm, I mean, uh, how to say, because we, we are the game, we're doing the game. We want to know uh, some 
different games by how much uh, time they are playing a game. Uh, I mean, because now we are using Prometheus, mm -hmm. but see, we need to inject the logic into our. Oh, okay. So with Prometheus, can you um, write arbitrary code? Like, what programming language does it use? Or is it its uh, own configuration? Uh, because it, we are JVM stack, with Java stack. Okay. We, we inject, uh, actually we put the logic in our code. Some in, our, in every node. So it will push the message to, uh, it will pull the message from our uh, service uh, okay. to our application. Uh, I'm not sure how, how we learn. I think it's called semantic monitoring. Uh, so basically, uh, application having an ability to push its internal state uh, to the external monitoring tool. For example, yes. if, you want, if you have your own uh, application state where you want the external guy to know how many connections are. Right, uh, right. Uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, we, um, we, we, we do send like custom application uh, information. Because you know, all you need to do is uh, install Riemann's client API into your application. Then you can send oh. events. You can attach, and the cool thing is you can attach as many uh, attributes as you want to the data model. Similar way. Uh, Sorry. I mean, that's a similar way. Actually, there's an agent, and it may pull or you push. OK, yeah. How does the uh, application actually, I didn't get the part where, how does the application actually connect with the So it pushes the data, right? Yeah. So how, how does it like subscribe? Like it has to connect to the API of the and Yeah, so, uh, so Riemann's just uh, uses, uh, it, you know, it opens a TCP socket. So any uh, component that wants to send events to Riemann just, um, you know, connects to the socket, and then you're sending uh, protocol buffers. It's uh, Riemann's yeah, yeah, uh, protocol language. So you, you still need to put the logic inside your uh, application or service code. Yeah, but there's a lot of uh, client libraries available for Riemann, including you know, Java, Go, and so on. So, so it's collect the JVM uh, data or status, then send to Riemann. Yeah, you can definitely do that. Blob. Like switch off. Uh, yeah, I, I don't see why not. W but what use case would you have for this blob data? If something crashes, then you want to take the screenshot just before it. Right, right. Just off the top of my head. Take a screenshot before it crashes. Screenshot. Yeah, you, you can definitely do that because. Uh, well, I guess uh, when I mentioned that um, with Riemann events, you can attach arbitrary fields. Uh, these fields are actually encoded as strings. So you'll be essentially encoding your uh, JPEG image into a string. And you know, probably um, you just want to not have to process it within Riemann, but just pass that string onto your um, you know, alert system or whatever, right? Yeah, you can you can do that as well. Uh, how how do you maintain you in twenty four hours? I mean, if in case if I update my logic or maybe I want to check other stuff. Okay, that's a. So, um, are you saying that uh, when you want to update the Riemann configuration, how do you do that? Yeah. So uh, as I mentioned, Riemann keeps a. Uh, in memory store of all the events. So when you, re, uh, when you restart Riemann, you essentially lose the uh, index store. So uh, your, the way you use Riemann should be that uh, you don't depend on long-lived events in the index. Um, however, um, currently Riemann doesn't have this capability, but you know, they, uh, I don't see anything stopping you know, uh, creating like some read this back end for Riemann. Uh, in addition, Riemann also has a, a experimental support for reloading its configuration without restarting the server as well. Um, but I found that 
to be a bit problematic. Uh, does Riemann have a network preview? Yes, yes, you can connect to a live running Riemann instance. And um, what's, so what, what's pretty cool is that um, like we have this Riemann instance and I can just write arbitrary qu queries from my desktop and send it to Riemann and, and I can like just extract um, you know, information about like, uh, like how many holes and what kind of events are in the Riemann's index from anywhere. You don't have to use the network repo. You can use that. There's also lots of common line tools to, to make queries of your live uh, Riemann index. Yeah. But yeah, you can definitely use the rep repo as well. How you make it secure? You can make it secure uh, to uh, oh, yes. security. How you, how you do that? If you open the repo, then uh, that, that provide you a box? So uh, to deal with security, uh, I believe Riemann supports um, uh, client uh, server certificates. So, uh, you know, any uh, communication um, would be through a secured connection using uh, certificates. Sorry. Um, so, I think that... think the I'll function is override with some uh, monitoring tools or for example, if you say the alert function, but um, because you already sent you uh, the like uh, flux DB or some other DB, actually they, they already maintain the state. Uh, or whether you, you think this function is overlap with memory, because they already they persist into the state. Even you 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 remain down in, the, in their side, it's still there. Yes. Uh, yeah. You. You will use InfluxDB to, to store like performance data about your cluster over time, but you can't so much um, do arbitrary computation based on those events. So, uh, so that's where I see the use case for Riemann is like writing really intelligent alerts and you know uh, being able to attach lots of um, context to your alerts that you're being that you're sending out right. Oh. Thanks. <laughs>